Some months later, Jane's body was found in the woods where she had run from her friends and gone missing. The spot had been searched thoroughly by police and volunteers. The police and family did not disclose a cause of death, but they did say it did not look like a homicide. Between the day the video appeared online and the day she went missing, it had been 813 days exactly. After Jane's body was found, the Deep website, which had been locked again with a new username and password for six months or so after Jane went missing, was finally cracked. The video had changed. The inscription read Emily Forster, 12. The video began by showing Emily walking with her friends along her street. It is handheld, the camera person hidden and far from the kids. Emily's arms are crossed in front of her and her head is down. She suddenly runs, crossing into the woods. Her friends give chase. The camera person moves forward toward the woods. The video cuts to minutes later. The camera person hides as Emily's friends exit the woods, unable to find her. 4chan, Reddit, and other social media sites began the search for Emily Forster. For the first day of the search, the name was even trending on Twitter. 12 days after the video was posted, 16-year-old Emily Forster was reported missing after she did not come home from her job in Creed, Colorado. This was nowhere near where Jane lived. Her friends told police she ran while coming home. She had been quiet all day, scared of something, but she wouldn't say what. Six days after she went missing, her body was found hanged in the woods five miles from her home. A second video was uploaded to the site that same day. I didn't know if I wanted to watch it. I remembered being awake those nights, just burning with curiosity and terror, needing to know what it was, what Jane had seen. As I paced my living room, trying to push myself to ignore it, I knew I would watch it, and a few minutes later, I did just that. Emily 12 Part 2 starts with a gritty video of a party. The camera moves among the older men and women, who smile and wave as they drink. The first thing I note, aside from the crappy quality of the video, is the attire. Men have big glasses, women have their hair sprayed stiff and curled, like something from the 70s, except it couldn't have been because as the camera reaches the kitchen window, we see her there, Emily Forster, taken in 2019 and chained to a pole. It is night, but there is a floodlight outside, and the identity of the girl is unmistakable. Emily stands and cries in the backyard. The cameraman raises his beer, the same beer as that which littered the yard in the previous video, as if giving her a toast. Emily is suddenly alert. She looks back to the dark behind her, listening. The man once again points to the ground, but Emily refuses to kneel. He tries two more times, but she stomps her foot in defiance. She turns to the black behind her, as if she heard something, and starts to scream. The cameraman turns back to the house. Everyone now has their back turned to the camera, all facing away from Emily. They stand there, their backs to us, doing nothing else. The video ends. Once again, I realized the timeline didn't add up. The first video of Emily running away was posted months before it happened. Again, I felt sick. I decided I was done with it. I left the site and the computer. I put it out of my mind and decided I wouldn't dig anymore. I didn't care who was next. I was done. And then, a few months later, the site updated. It was all over Reddit. Everyone was talking about the diary. I couldn't help myself. I went back on. Instead of a video, there was a picture. It was the cover of a red diary. The label read, This diary is the property of... But the name had been scratched off. There was an arrow at the bottom. I clicked it and the picture changed the first two pages of the diary. The date read August 9th, but the year had also been scratched off. The first few pages were regular diary entries. It belonged to a girl in middle school, or at least it read that way. Then there was a really strange entry. Unlike the others, it wasn't about the boys in her class she had a crush on, or her friends who mostly liked her for her pool. This one was about her sister, who had died a year earlier from anaphylactic shock. It read, It's been one year today since Cindy died. My mom said if I can't talk about it, I should write about it, and I definitely can't talk about it. It was the worst night of my life. I can still feel the bunk bed shaking. I hear her choking, but the worst part... Even worse than hearing my sister dying is how I just lay there, listening, too afraid to do anything, until finally the shaking stopped.
She had been bitten by a spider. It wasn't super venomous, but she was allergic. Mom got rid of the bunk beds, but when I wake up, I still see her arms sticking out above me. Then my eyes adjust, and I realize I'm just looking at the ceiling. One night, I woke up feeling like I was being watched. The feeling was so strong that I was more scared of turning on the light than I was of being in the dark. What if I see what's watching me? And then I noticed that the terrible feeling was all coming from one spot in my room. Not a dark corner where something might be hiding, but the stand-up mirror by my closet door. I got up and walked over to it, hoping that seeing it up close would lessen my fear a little. But I still hadn't turned the light on, so all I saw was my silhouette. Something was off. I couldn't tell what. I couldn't see my face, so I don't know what it could be. But the reflection in the mirror, something about it was off. I threw a sheet over to cover it up and went back to bed. The mirror was tall and the top curved, so when it stood under the sheet, it looked like a person just standing there in the corner of my room. The feeling that I was being watched never went away. Actually, it got much worse. I kept it covered for the next two weeks. It was only when I absolutely had to pull the sheet off that I finally did. It was really late one night when I heard someone tapping on the glass of my window. My room was on the second floor, so I was really scared to see who it was. A million thoughts ran through my mind while I got up and walked to the window, like maybe it was a vampire or just red eyes in the dark. When I finally got to the window and pulled the curtain aside, I saw there was no one there. It wasn't until that moment I had realized the tapping was coming from behind me. It was coming from the mirror. I was shaking worse than ever. My mouth was dry, my legs weak, but I had to know what it was. I pulled the sheet down. The tapping stopped. Again, it was too dark to see my reflection, but that wasn't my focus anymore because now I looked past myself to the rest of the room and I saw something I didn't recognize. There was a TV in the same spot as mine, except it was a totally different model, like it was from a long time ago. And my bed wasn't my bed. It was bunk beds, like we used to have. There was someone sleeping on the top bunk. I could see her shape under the blankets, but not much else. And as I stood there watching, the shape began to stir. She woke up. It looked like my sister, but wasn't. Even though she was mostly hidden in the dark of the room, I could tell it wasn't really her. She became really happy when she saw me. She rolled from the bunk to the ladder on the side, her arms and legs stiff like they had been after she died. She limped toward me. I turned from the mirror and saw my room as it really was. There was no one in the dark, but when I looked back into the mirror, I saw what she really was. That was the end of the entry. I turned the pages, and on each one there was only one sentence, the same sentence written over and over again, sometimes a dozen times, sometimes hundreds. It still haunts me. It haunts me to wonder about what she saw that night, and the nights that followed. The sentence that covered the rest of the diary was simply, Don't look in the mirror. (laughs) 